Thank you so much for taking time of your precious day to come and listen to the fourth annual Canada Gardner Awards lecture at the University of Lethbridge. For those who don't know me, I am Erasmus Okine, and I'm the Vice President Research at this university. I am very pleased to welcome all of you here to, today to hear Dr. Rodolf Barango, the 2016 recipient of the Canada Gartner International Award. How many of you have heard of the Gartner Awards? Oh, quite a few of, of you. For those who haven't, this award is Canada's most prestigious medical award. The foundation recognizes and celebrates the research of the world's best and brightest biomedical researchers. Established in 1959, more than 320 Canada Gartner Awards have been awarded to scientists from 15 countries. Of this 320, 83 of them, about a third of them, have gone on to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. That's the type of person you're going to be listening to today. Indeed, one of last year's winners of the Gartner Awards, Dr. Um, I'm going to butcher his name now, Yoshinori Oshumi, won this year's Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. So the University of Lethbridge is very pleased to have today's event sponsored by the Gartner Awards and their partners, Burroughs Welcome, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, CFI, the Canada Institutes for Health Research, CIHR, the Globe and Mail, and the governments of Canada and Alberta. On this very campus, we are pleased to have this year's hosted by the Alberta RNA Research and Training Institute as part of their symposium, RNA meets DNA, from molecules to medicine and everything in between. Let's say thank you to our team. Now to introduce Dr. Barango. He earned a BSc in Biological Sciences from René Descartes University in, in France, a Master's in Biological Engineering from the University of of technology in Champagne, oh, Champagne in France and an MSc in food science from NC State in the US and he obtained a PhD in genomics from North Carolina State and an MBA from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Currently Rodolph is an associate professor in the Department of Food Bioprocessing and Nutritional Sciences at North Carolina State focusing on the evolution and functions of the CRISPR-Cas systems and the applications in bacteria used in food manufacturing. Rodolph is also an associate member of the Microbiology Graduate Program, the Biotechnology Graduate Program, the Functional Genomics Graduate Program, and a Comparative Medicine Institute. He's also a distinguished scholar in probiotics research and he's a North Carolina State University Distinguished Scholar and a recipient of the 2014 NC State Alumni Associ Association Outstanding Research Award. Recently, he received the 2016 War uh, Warren Albert Prize and, of course, the 2016 the Canada Gartner International Award. He's also worked in industry He's also on the board of, the, of directors of the Caribou Biosciences, a co-founder and a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Intelia Therapeutics and a co-founder of Locos Biosciences. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Dr. Rudolf Barango. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my uh, distinguished pleasure to be here 
to be the ambassador for the day for the Garner Foundation and to get to talk to you about one of the most compelling, one of the most timely, one of the most fascinating and dramatic topics in science today and likely for the decades to come. Uh, so very fittingly, I'm going to talk about CRISPR-Cas systems, various CRISPR-Cas systems, all the CRISPR-Cas systems, the ones you like, the one you know, the ones you've heard about, the one you will work on, perhaps for some of you, for the rest of your life. And I'm going to walk you through how they changed over time from this mysterious, intriguing, and interesting, peculiar adaptive immune system in bacteria, and then were repurposed, repackaged uh, to be the genome editing machines that you're likely here to hear about, but you won't just hear about that today. Okay, so I'm going to do four things. I'm going to try to walk you through the very basic scientific underpinning of CRISPR-Cas biology. Kind of the basic science, the basic discoveries, the basic foundations, and the understanding of how those early discoveries are and will continue to be the molecular basis for the buildup and the repurposing of some of those molecular machines. And then I'll walk you through how those molecular machines have been repurposed into what we now call CRISPR technology, or what I like to refer to as CRISPR technologies, with an S. There's many types of CRISPR-Cas technologies you can use to drive the genome editing revolution. And this is really what, what is getting the bulk of the attention as of today. And then we can already go through a number of applications that have made, that are making, that will continue to make a very tangible impact in genome editing and beyond, and creating commercial business and therapeutic opportunities for pharma, biotech, ag, and others. And then last but not least, though this is primarily a, a scientific topic, I feel compelled to give you my take on, on the CRISPR craze as a great example of how disruptive innovation can disrupt the science, but also disrupt businesses, also disrupt the media, also disrupt the perception of the public of science, and talk about GMOs and CRISPR babies and all that stuff. And, and I'll talk about the good stuff and the bad stuff about some of the impacts that CRISPR-based sciences have had to date. So let's start with the science. This is always starts with the science. Science has to be at the basis of most of the things that we do. And I can't think of a better thing to start with than an actual CRISPR. So who's read about CRISPR before? Who's used CRISPR in the lab? If I ask the same question next year or three years from now, everybody's going to raise their hand, right? <laughs> now, what's interesting about CRISPR is that most people misconstrue what CRISPR actually is. And this is an actual CRISPR, right? CRISPR is an acronym which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And for those of you in the audience who are or are aspiring CRISPR expert and lovers, you should be in absolute awe of what you're seeing right now. Right? Anybody see anything? You don't look at sequences enough, right? So this is what you'd be seeing right here. Right? Uppercase. And if you're not adverse to the uh, Canadian flag colors, this is what you'd be seeing. This is an actual CRISPR. It's a clustered, regularly interspaced, short, palindromic repeat locus, right? Because all those DNA repeats are clustered together in the genome. They're regularly interspaced with exquisite periodicity, the genetic periodicity to them, right? Almost three turns of a helix per unit of either a repeat or a spacer, right? Regularly interspaced, they're short. Those elements are usually 31 to 36 nucleotides long, whether you look at the repeat or the spacer. They are partially palindromic. The five prime and is the reverse complement of the three prime and for those paying attention and who have a particular endearing to the RNA world. And then there are DNA repeat, clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. This may be the first time you see a CRISPR array. It may sadly be the last time you see a CRISPR array. Uh, but if you saw one thing today, it was seeing a CRISPR for the first time and the last time in your life. Okay. So another thing that's interesting about CRISPR, which we talk about extensively, uh, is that CRISPR is not three years old. CRISPR technologies, in the way you construe them, may be three-year-old. But CRISPR is actually a kind of a 30-year-old guy walking around, um, a little younger than me, obviously. You know, but, but the first report of CRISPR dates all the way back to 1987. I am not going to walk you through the history of CRISPR. 
I did that two weeks ago uh, when I gave my, my um, uh, lecture for, for, for the uh, laureates together with Philippe. But I invite you all to go online and listen to the first 20 minutes of our seminar to appreciate the various types of historical ages and periods that CRISPR science went through. If you are a science history enthusiast or you're really curious about CRISPR, you should understand about the, the antiquity, the dark ages of CRISPR, right? And then how eventually we went from this to the Middle Ages. And then the Renaissance in 2007, launching us into the modern period, eventually triggering a series of discoveries that enabled the CRISPR-based, CRISPR-fueled genome editing revolution, for which a number of my co-laureates are getting um, uh, recognition for through the Gardner Foundation. So I'll walk you through that to some extent, but I think it's important to appreciate that CRISPR is not just this most charming three-year-old you've ever seen in your life. So actually, my journey with CRISPR started when I was in industry. And it's kind of interesting to tell the story that way because most people or wrongly or falsely assume that the best science occurs in the ivory tower, which it sometimes does, right, arguably, right? even in Canada, I think so, I could say that, right? Um, but actually, sometimes it's not the case. And sometimes industry is very good at making discoveries. And in this particular case, what's interesting is that it all started with, a, with an, an observation I'm going to walk you through right now. And that observation led to a, an hypothesis that we were able and also allowed at the corporate level to actually test and then eventually make the, the discovery that launched us away from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance and the modern period of CRISPR. So, so just, just give me a minute here and don't necessarily just pay attention to the slides. So uh, in 2004, my job at DuPont was to sequence the genomes of the great bacteria that make the best cheese and yogurt in the world. DuPont is number one or number two, depending on the quarter, uh, dairy culture manufacturer in the world. And unfortunately, oftentimes, some of those great dairy cultures that make the best fermented products in the world get hammered by phages. Phages happen, E. coli happens, things happen, right? Um, and what we were doing is trying to understand the genomic basis for the ability to resist to phages. We will also try to understand the genomic and genetic basis for the ability to make great yogurt, right, acidification of milk and texture and the like. And we're also trying to understand what parts of the genome are hypervariable enough for us to do advanced genotyping of bacteria. And one of the things that we came across was a CRISPR, something like this. Right, very hard to assemble, by the way, so I can talk about that if you're curious. Um, but we observed very early on that those, those repeats in between the spacers are hypervariable. And if you take a number of strains, right, shown on the right, each line here is one strain, and you sequence their CRISPRs, and you take out the repeats because they're all the same, and you just represent the spacers as a two-color combination code, to, re to indicate and reflect a unique DNA sequence, you get kind of genetic barcodes of DNA fingerprints. And what we saw here, right, the first observation, was that different groups cluster together. So you can see, if you zoom in here, these group, right, they all, they all share those commonalities. These group, they all share those commonalities. These group, they all share those commonalities, and so on and so forth. And we saw that CRISPR was great as a genetic typing tool, but the key observation, right, was that actually those genetic groups, those genotypes, the genotypic information was correlating with a phenotype. And the phenotype was phage resistance. That was the observation. That was the eureka moment that started the whole thing for me, is that all those strains were resistant, sensitive to the same phages. And all those strains were resistant, sensitive to the same phages. And all those strains were resistant, sensitive to the same phages. Suggesting, it's a very rare time in your life you can do that, suggesting that there might be a link between the CRISPR genotype and the phage resistance phenotype. And a very careful evaluation of some of those strains, right, we could tell that occasionally there would be slight differences in the CRISPR content that correlated with slight differences in CRISPR resistance or sensitivities. That was that was the observation that started it all. 
So we embarked on a series of three experiments. And those experiments are like from 2004, 2005. So they're so 13 years ago. CRISPR world is like the dark ages, right? <laughs> but it's a series of three experiments which led us to the publication of a paper, which is why I received the Gardner Award. The one paper in 07 that launched the field, arguably. So we took this strain. This strain is a CRISPR-Cas system. It has 33 repeats, 32 spacers. You number them from right to left for reasons that will become obvious to you in about three and a half minutes. And then next to those CRISPR arrays, right, you have the Cas, Cas protein. So CRISPR on the right, Cas on the left. CRISPR associated sequences, the genes that encode the Cas protein. And we took that strain, which is a great strain, makes it one of the best yogurt in the world, but it's sensitive to phages. So this strain genetically has 32 spacers and it's sensitive to phage one and phage two. We took that strain, exposed it to the, this phage, and upon becoming resistant to that phage, had acquired novel pieces of DNA into its CRISPR. That's the eureka moment. We took the same host, exposed it to the orange phage, and upon becoming resistant to that phage, you had acquired new spacers at this end of the locus. And when we exposed this strain to both phages at the same time, like a phage cocktail, like you guys mix your drinks to have a cocktail, we mix the phage to give a cocktail to the bacterium, and upon becoming inebriated with those phages, it acquired a series of spacers at this end of the locus. That's the first experiment indicating that we observe polarized addition of spacers at that end only, which is why they're numbered right to left, because you add them iteratively over time. This is new spacer 33, 33, 34, and so on and so forth, 35, 36, and so on and so forth. And that suggested, it didn't prove anything, that suggested that there might be a correlation between the ability of the CRISPR locus to acquire a new piece of DNA and its ability to resist phage attack. Now, even in 2004, people had access to fairly affordable sequencing. So at DuPont, we were sequencing the host, we were sequencing the phages, and what we saw was that systematically, those sequences that popped up and were acquired upon becoming resistant matched exactly sequences in the genomes of the viruses that were used in the challenge assay. Okay. And occasionally, you know, we could see that spacers were targeted from one strand or the other, a very strong indicator of a double-strandedness of the mechanism of action for CRISPR. Um, and that the sampling, right, the sampling was coming from all functional and genetic modules of the phage genome. So there was some kind of randomness to it um, to some extent, and this is why we started calling this a vaccination card, whereby the historical record of the vaccination events captures genetic Polaroid shots, snapshots, Snapchats, pictures, whatever makes sense to you, of the pieces of DNA that invade this genome and then get captured from a DNA standpoint into the CRISPR locus in an iterative, time-dependent manner. So what we really wanted to do next was to try to test whether indeed there might be a link between the CRISPR genotype and the phage resistance phenotype. So we have one of my favorite experiments of all time that I actually carried out in my lab in uh, Wisconsin, like South Canada. Um, uh, we went in and then we tinkered with the CRISPR content to try to see if when we change the genetic content of the CRISPR, we could alter the phage resistance of sensitivity phenotype. So the first thing that we did is we added CRISPR spacers that were matching a virus by genetic engineering before CRISPR existed, right? Like old school genome editing. We put those in and then when you add those, you are resistant. We took them out and when you remove them, you become sensitive. We put them in the wrong context in a non-CRISPR locus and those didn't work. And in arguably my favorite experiment of all time, we took two strains that were resistant and sensitive to two different phages and we did a CRISPR transplant. We did an immune system transplant, and we showed that when you switch the CRISPR profiles, you actually switch the phage resistance profiles, essentially establishing for the first time that there might be a link indeed between the CRISPR content and phage resistance. Now, of course, you, maybe most of you are familiar with the mechanism of eviction 
mafia, right? The reviewers that want to understand the mechanism of action of your phenomenon. Otherwise, you can get published, or you don't get published in the journals that you like. Uh, so we knew there were CAS genes next to it, and we all know about the genetic linkage, right? Functionally of things that are go together in operons and the like. And we saw that when we remove or delete or knock out Cas9, we lose the ability to be resistant. Okay, essentially implicating Cas9 in resistance. And then when we remove, delete, or inactivate CSN2, we don't lose the resistance profile, but we lose the ability to acquire new immunogenic markers. Those three experiments showed that CRISPR, together with Cas, provide a genetic basis for adaptive immunity in bacteria, and this is why Philippe and I are being recognized for our work on CRISPR by the Gardner Foundation. Now, this is so 2007, right? It's like a long time ago, right? So since then, to give you an idea of what we've done, in 2008, we were the team that discovered the PAM, and essentially the very conserved motif in the areas of the phage genomes that are strictly conserved for the sampling, the acquisition, and the interference assay. In 2010, uh, in a paper published in Nature, we were the first to show that Cas9 is an endonuclease, which has the ability to selectively and precisely cut DNA exactly three nucleotides away from the three prime edge of that spacer. And in 2011, we were the first to show that you can take CRISPR and transplant it to a new organism, in this particular case, E. coli, and reprogram CRISPR to make it target other phages. In that particular case, very classically, we targeted phage lambda, and essentially we synthetically reprogrammed the CRISPR to target phage lambda into E. coli. And then last but not least, in 2012, we showed together with Virgis uh, that uh, Cas9 is a double-stranded Nicase, where one motif H and H and the other one rough C each nick one strand from the endonuclease right here. Okay. Now, Emmanuel came into the picture in 2011 when she showed that in addition to the CRISPR RNA, you need tracer RNA, the dual guide RNA that you may be familiar with, to function uh, in aspirogenes. And in 2012, mostly Jennifer in collaboration with Emmanuel, were able to show that you could repackage that system to cut any DNA you want in vitro, and we go into the contemporary period of genome editing when Fong and his team and George Church to a lesser extent showed in 2013 they could repackage this system to drive genome editing in eukaryotes and I'll talk about that in a minute. So essentially what you need to know about CRISPR if you only think about its functional role in bacteria is that it is composed of two elements the CRISPR arrays and the Cas genes it is DNA encoded or an immediated DNA targeting the CRISPR array defines the acquisition process and vaccinates the cell. Once you're vaccinated, you transcribe your RNA into CRISPR RNA, and this CRISPR RNA will act as a guide for the Cas nucleases that target specifically and efficiently complementary sequences of interest to drive double-stranded DNA breaks and phage DNA cleavage in this natural state. Now, one thing you need to know about CRISPRs is that there's many different types of CRISPR-Cas systems in nature, right? So I'm not going to bore you with the phylogenetics of CRISPR. If you want to talk about that, let me know. I'll talk to your ear off for a couple hours about diversity of CRISPRs. There's class one and class two, depending on the diversity and the biochemical nature and processes by which those enzymes target and cut DNA and process their interfering RNAs. The bottom line is that they are very diverse genetically. They're very diverse biochemically. Uh, they occur in about half of bacteria and 90% of all archaea. Uh, and in nature, type 1s and class 1 um, uh, CRISPR-Cas systems are the most dominant force. The type 2 systems only represent about 12.5% of all the CRISPR-Cas systems that exist to date. Some of you who may be very well versed with CRISPR diversity, the type 5 is this little sliver right here of which there's only 19 in all the databases to date. So many different types of CRISPR-Cas systems. And if you look at class one on the left and class two on the right, right, they share um, mechanistic commonalities. They are all DNA encoded in the CRISPR. They are all guide RNA mediated, and they're all nucleic acid targeting. Some of them target DNA. A few of them selectively target RNA. 
okay, the exception to the rule. Notwithstanding those commonalities, various CRISPR Cas systems have their own mechanistic, genetic, and biochemical idiosyncrasies. So the actual nature, sequence, and structure of the guide RNAs that direct the Cas nucleases vary widely. See here, there's a single RNA with a uh, hairpin on the right, three prime tail. There's the dual guide RNA, you know, from Cas2, the CRNA and the tracer RNA. There's a single guide RNA here with the tail on the left. And there's a, there's a non-structurally dependent uh, small interfering RNAs in type 3 systems. And the effector proteins that carry the targeting and the kind of sequences that they target using the PAM-dependent targeting very widely. But what's really interesting here, and I'll talk a little bit about that, is the type of nucleic acid cleavage that they drive very widely. You may be very familiar, and I'll talk more exclusively about the clean, blunt DNA breaks, that is the dual nicking by H and H and rough C that type two systems do. Again, exactly three integrals away from the three prime end of the spacer sequence. Uh, there is a sticky end cleavage for type fives, which for some genome repair is useful. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the uh, a type three is more of a shredder. So if you're a food scientist and you think about doing that in the kitchen, right, you're like, you know, fillet the RNA, so to speak. Uh, and then in, in a back to the future moment, I, like, I equate class one to the Pac-Man, right? Where there's a very rare three prime to five prime exonucleolytic uh, cleavage type of the, here we go, of the uh, target DNA strand that way. And it's very interesting because post NIC, you have an ATP dependent, metal dependent, three prime to five prime, very quick exonuclease activity that allows you to tear out and tear apart one strand of the target DNA. Very lethal in bacteria. I'll get back to this later. So there's different kind of CRISPR Cas systems. Nonetheless, most of the hype is about type two systems. So I'm going to talk about type two systems a little bit in more in more details, so we can all get ready for the gene editing craze. So imagine you are a post-perennial bacterium. You just had your lunch. You're coming to a great talk. You're relaxed. I'm going to like woo you to sleep. So you're laying down right here, but you're still awake. And you're very well endowed with a powerful type 2 system. You have Cas9, so you're golden. We'll get rich eventually genetically. You have 33 repeats, the same 32 spacers I talked to you about. And you've been vaccinated 32 times. Unfortunately, you make a bad decision in your life and you get exposed to a virus, intentional or not, accidental or not, serendipitous or not, and then this virus is going to inject its DNA into the cell. And some of the cast machinery involved in acquisition and adaptation will recognize this as non-self. So Cas1, Cas2 integration complex, notably. It is then going to scan, scan that DNA for motifs it has a particular biochemical appetite for, namely the PAM. In the case of SPY and GG, in the case of my favorite yogurt bacterium, and NAGAAW, and then Cas1 together with Cas2 is going to make a copy and paste. So it's not cut and paste. Right? Think of a photocopy machine, right? or again, a Polaroid or a portrait or Snapchat, or whatever, whatever you can think of, depending on your generational gap. It's going to make a copy of the sequence, de novo, okay, and then attach this to one CRISPR repeat. So you build up a repeat spacer unit. And the template for that repeat is the most leader and the most five front and the most transcribed piece of the array. So that, that repeat is a template, and you're going to take this repeat spacer unit and integrate that into your CRISPR as new spacer S1, or spacer number 33, the 33rd wagon on your CRISPR train, and you are now vaccinated. You are now safe. You are now going to make it. And the reason you make it is because then this whole locus, this whole array, this whole CRISPR is transcribed as a full-length pre-CRISPR RNA, which is then matured using the tracer RNA, the helper RNA, and RNAs3 into small interfering RNA, mature small interfering RNA, that only contain one single target sequence from a vaccination event, and the five prime end of the CRISPR repeat. Okay? So you have the small interfering RNAs, like, kind of like bacterial type RNAi, so 2006, and you're coming in, and those small interfering CRISPR RNAs are going to guide the Cas machinery 
towards complementary sequences, and then selectively, efficiently, and specifically nick each strand. At the top here using RFC, at the bottom here using HNH. Okay? So you have this dual nicking action using dual guide RNAs that enable you to cut the DNA of that phage and survive phage infection, and you can go on with your life. This is CRISPR. This is everything you need to know about. Maybe not everything you need to know. This is the basics you need to know about CRISPR technology, DNA encoded, RNA mediated, DNA targeting. Now, the life of CRISPR took a turn when people, as aforementioned, my co-recipients with the Gerner Award, turned this into what you now call CRISPR technology. What I'm going to try to convince you is CRISPR technologies. Okay, and I, in 2012, called this a molecular scalpel, right, which enables genome editing. So think of yourself for a minute as a DNA artist, okay, and imagine you know nothing or everything you know about genome editing is incorrect or misconstrued, right? And um, just bear with me for a minute. That's what I use when I talk to the 10-year-olds, right? And even high school students understand that. Um, so imagine you have your, your DNA, right, and you have your molecular scalpel. Right, your razor. So depending on your genotype and phenotype, you may use razors to shave different parts of your body. And occasionally, you're going to have a mishap. Occasionally, you're going to cut a lesion into your skin. Again, whatever part of your body makes sense to you. Um, and when you make a lesion in that skin, right, the skin repair pathway gets turned on, and you're going to patch it back together. Okay? And what happens is the same with DNA. You're going to come in, and you're going to patch those things back together, all right? So hang on to that thought for a minute. It's a molecular scalpel. The advantage of CRISPR is that it is the most promising, most charming, most compelling three-year-old you've ever seen in your life, right? It's programmable, it's specific, transferable, efficient, precise, affordable, quick, multiplexable, and scalable. Right? So think of your favorite tennis player, your favorite hockey player, your favorite basketball player, whatever curling players you guys have here. Like, you can do it all best all time. Okay? But if you're a parent or if you have younger siblings, it's only three years old. Okay? CRISPR is only three years old. Like any technology, it has its shortcomings. So CRISPR is still somewhat cumbersome. Right? So the Cas9-based machinery you need to package to do genome editing in humans using retroviruses, you know, is 1.45 KB, 1.45 uh, 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 thousand amino acids. It's very large. 4.5 KB is to pack into a small retrovirus. It's somewhat cumbersome, a little bit too big. Can you make CRISPR smaller, right? It also has PAM-dependent targeting. So the bullseye that you use right here is honing in on the PAM, right? So if you have a, you know, NGG or AGAW or whatever it is that your Cas9 does, right, you are encumbered and limited with your targeting space, okay? So, you know, you want more flexibility. We'll talk a little bit about off-target cleavage. There's a lot of arm waving about off-target cleavage. But the real shortcoming, in my opinion, of CRISPR is that no, not all guys are created equal. Some work better for targeting, have even higher efficiencies of cleavage. And the types of genetic repairs and outcomes that you get vary widely depending on the sequence of interest. So we'll talk about that to some extent, okay? But it still needs to grow to its teenage years. And what's interesting about CRISPR is that it has taken the world by storm because it is such a powerful genome editing technology. So this is what Jennifer and Emmanuel are being recognized for. This is the level and the extent and the beauty behind their guide. They took this dual guide system with the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA, and created an artificial linker, artificial linker, which turned a full component system. Because you needed the CRISPR array, you needed the CRISPR RNA, the tracer RNA, and RNA3. Most people forget about RNA3, right? Nobody should leave RNA3 behind, right? Put RNA3 in the corner, right? Especially the RNA people. So you come in, and what they did is they repackaged this full component system into a two-component system. One enzyme, one guide. That's what people call the single guide technology, where they went in and they replaced this with just this. Beautiful. Simple, biochemically, biochemical wizardry 
arguably, and now you have a portable system that enables you to target DNA. Now, the, the real revolution, right, is not just when you do the cutting, because doing the cutting is the easy part, right? Doing the cutting is the easy part. So when you come in and shave your legs, shave your head, shave your cheeks, or whatever part of your body you have to shave, depending on your lifestyle and idiosyncrasies, right? Occasionally, you're going to nick yourself. So now you nick yourself, right? And you want to repair that. So either you're going to, quote unquote, like man up, right? Put some dirt on it, right? Put some water on it, put some aftershave on it, not, right? And, or put duct tape on it, or tape on it, or fish net on it, or whatever you need to do, right? And then you're going to have a little scar, right? So this is what happens when you do NHEJ with DNA. You're going to come in, you're going to take two non homologous DNA ants that have been nicked, right? And you're going to patch them back together, sew them back together, and have a little scar with that, right? So genetically and genomically, NHEJ is error prone. So you're going to come in and you have an array of SNPs or single nucleotide variations, SNVs, right? Small insertions, small deletions, right? So this is like the barbaric way or the quick and dirty way to do DNA repair. Alternatively, you can use homology-directed repair, whereby in order for you to repair this double-stranded DNA break, the cell repair machinery is going to use a template, a homologous sequence either elsewhere in the genome that's homologous enough to be a template on both ends, or another allele, if you have such luxury of other alleles in your genome, or very critically, a synthetically made available provision by the experimenter template. And now, the experimenter has the ability to provide a template in trance to the DNA repair machinery and coerce the cell into repairing this break with your engineered mutation. You can engineer a template, sometimes SSDNA, sometimes DSDNA, to have a single SNP mutation or a targeted insertion, or a targeted deletion. And the types of manipulations that you can do, that's why it's called genome editing, is you don't just rewrite one letter. You don't just change one typo, one SNP. You have the ability to integrate or remove a word, integrate or remove a sentence, integrate or remove a paragraph, integrate or remove a page, integrate or remove a whole chapter in your genetic book of life. This is the power of genome editing. This is why Fong, arguably, has made the biggest contribution today. Okay. Now, of course, one of the great things about CRISPR is that it has shed light on the fact that DNA repair is not just HDR and HEJ. This is a simplistic way to view DNA repair. There's alternative enjoining, microbiology mediating enjoining, other repair pathways and systems that come in, and they're hypervariable. There's heteroscedasticity in the repair pathways in terms of cell phases and types of cleavage and type of cell cycles and type of repair pathways and locations and guides that you use. So if you want to talk about that, we shall. So this is why, and by the way, this is so 2013, right? This is why in the last three years, CRISPR has turned into CRISPR-based technologies. Where we come in and you can use Cas9, you can use Cas9 and do deletions, do insertions, or do knockouts, quick and dirty knockouts, NHEJ or HDR, right? Now what you can actually do is you can inactivate the aforementioned dual nickase, okay? And you can take your Cas9 and inactivate each nicking domain, namely HNH and RFC each responsible for one nick on the target DNA strand. And what you have now is a very powerful molecular machines that you can program using a single guide RNA to bind to your DNA of interest. And the biochemical intimacy with which this interaction occurs is so strong energetically that it will stop an RNA polymerase in its tracks. If you're a biochemist, you're very impressed. Okay, so essentially you can come in and you can target a promoter sequence of interest to you and prevent transcription. It's called CRISPR-I, CRISPR interference. Conversely, you can tether this DCAS9, deactivated Cas9, to a traditional activator and turn transcription up. You can recruit 
And now you can upregulate and downregulate genes and transcription as you see fit. You can obviously recruit any effector domain of interest, maybe to change the physical state, the coiling, the stereophysical availability of your DNA sequence of interest. You can tether DCAS9 to fluorophores and do imaging with however many concurrent fluorophores as you want. It's called CRISPR rainbow, right? And then last but not least, you can fuse DCAS9 to methylases and acetylases and acetyltransferases and rewrite the epigenetic state of your sequence of interest. That's why rewriting CRISPR, rewriting the genome, Cas9 is so 2013. You can now come in and you don't just rewrite the text. You can change how it's delivered. Is it going to be very loud or very quiet? Is it going to be unlightened? Is it going to be methylated or not? You can rewrite any sequence you want, any way you want, in any organism you want. And as a matter of fact, it has already happened. This is so 2015. Right? The number of organisms in which CRISPR-Cas systems have been used for genome editing is too long to be listed. Some people like me used to to keep track. It's just, it's just too cumbersome, too inefficient, unlike CRISPR. Right? So look at those, those fields of, of applications, right? the model organisms, the viruses, the bacteria, the yeast, Drosophila, C. elegans, fish, rabbit, and so on and so forth, right? more human-relevant model systems, even plants. Think about that. Right? But obviously, model organisms are only so good as the model itself. Right now, this is what a disruptive technology can do. It can enable people to bypass the model and go straight to the real stuff. That's why nowadays, ag is so key on using CRISPR-based technologies for genome editing of relevant plants and relevant organisms. I understand you guys like kind of cattle is a big thing in Alberta, right? Corn, maize, I should say, right? Wheat, barley, okay? Even shrimp, if you give the talk in Louisiana, they're like that. <laughs> Tomatoes, right? Mushrooms, right? And arguably some of the most significant advances to date, maybe not from a commercial standpoint, I'll get back to that, but from a uh, scientific standpoint, have happened in the medical world, right? Where people can now rewrite genetic diseases. They can correct alleles. So I'm going to give you just a few examples here, some of my favorites, right? So one of my dear friends, Charlie Gersbach at Duke, just down the street from NC State, he showed you can cure Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. You can take adult mice that can't make dystrophin. You can inject into their leg muscles CRISPRs with the right templates to do HDR and correct exon 53 that's been skipped in the dystrophin gene and regrow muscle in adult mice. It's like science fiction, but just the science part. Okay? Uh, in what I call back to the future, because CRISPR was made as an antiviral in bacteria, CRISPR can be repurposed as an antiviral in humans. And people have shown you can design guides that target both ends of inserted HIV-1 and carve out and cure a human cell out of HIV. And by the way, when it's there, the cell is vaccinated forever. Some of the most promising currently available, currently investigated antiviral therapies are based on CRISPR-Cas system. You may have heard about gene drives, right? Where you can drive a genotype into a population of animals, population of bacteria, possibly population of humans, right? And you can come in, and people have shown you can target, like so like Y shredder or X shredder, depending on your genotype or phenotype, right? You can target chromosomes of interest and then drive sterilization at the population level in mosquitoes that carry malaria in Central America and South Africa. Unbelievable. It's happening, like, before our eyes, right? And then one of my friends, uh, George Church, is using CRISPRs to humanize pigs as organ donors for xenotransplantation, where they have a list of 27 most immunogenic, immunogenic genes 
responsible for rejections of transplants, and they are halfway done. By the end of 2017, it'll be so last year. I'll let you think about that, right? So the amount of progress in vitro, in vivo, ex vivo, obviously, uh, and in humans is unbelievable. And just so you know, there is ongoing recruitment for three distinct clinical trials, including some in the US, for CRISPR-based therapies. So it's happening so much so fast. Because this is an ag school, and a picture says a thousand words, this is what you can do with CRISPR. You can show that to five-year-olds and they get it, right? You can take, maybe this is not the best uh, color here. Maybe this is better, uh, maybe not. All right. Um, so you can take this butterfly, it's kind of a brownish butterfly, right? And butterflies' wing patterns are much like human retina or fingerprints. They're unique in the world. No two butterflies have the same pattern, even offspring. So you can take CRISPR, and you can go into some cells from that butterfly and correct or delete or knock out or change the yellow gene. And you can take out the yellow of that butterfly and make a butterfly this exact same wing pattern. Same butterfly, different color. You can do that with any color you want. You get the point. Now, however powerful, however intriguing, however valuable, however productive, however translationally relevant this technology has been, it is still somewhat imperfect. So we work a lot on things like guide selection, because not all guides are created equal. Guide optimization from an RNA and biochemical standpoint. Cas9 engineering and broadening of the PAM sequence. You can do all those by engineering, rational design, big hammers and small nails and have at it, right? And or you can do that by biodiversity sampling, okay? I'm not gonna talk about much about DNA repair today because this is not a gene therapy crowd, but keep in mind that cutting used to be the hard part. This is why genome editing 1.0 fell by ZFNs and talons and mechanocleases only went so far because it was cumbersome, slow, expensive, and inefficient. Everything CRISPR is not. Then comes CRISPR to the rescue. You can now do it programmably, affordably, specifically, efficiently, quickly, multiplexibly, and so on and so forth, and affordably, by the way, right? But cutting is only half the job. The hard part now is doing the editing, the repair of that DNA lesion, preferably to the target that you want, so keep that in mind. Nonetheless, we work on CRISPR RNAs. So one of the things we do in my lab, we work a lot on CRISPR RNAs to understand how we can drive efficiency of CRISPR-Cas targeting, how we can drive specificity of CRISPR-Cas targeting, and importantly, how we can drive orthogonality of CRISPR-Cas targeting. Because in the end, if you want to do all those things, right, right now you can only do them one at a time. Now, right now you can do them one at a time. But if you want to do editing, end of regulation, end of regulation, end imaging, end epigenetics, you can't. You have to be patient. Give us a few months, we'll get there. But the point right now is we're trying to work on orthogonality between systems to develop a series of tools, build up the CRISPR toolbox, so you can do all those different things with different tools that don't crosstalk. Think like a screwdriver with flat head versus Phillips head, right? The right screwdriver only works with the right screw. Same with CRISPR here. So this is my only RNA slide, but I feel compelled to talk you about RNA today because there's RNA people in the audience, right? One of my favorite papers, actually. So imagine you have the, the blue Cas9s, the orange Cas9s, the green Cas9s, right? And the blue Cas9s go with the blue guide, the orange Cas9s go with the orange guide, and the green Cas9s go with the green guide. Those guys may look the same to you, but actually they are not. If you're an RNA expert and you're crossing your eyes and looking at this thing, Right? You can tell there's differences here and here and here. And those differences are the differences that enable cleavage. And this is the piece which structurally is being recognized by Cas9 to drive specificity, interference, and efficiency of cleavage. And what we've shown, long story short, is that the blue guide only works with the blue Cas9, the orange guide only works with the orange Cas9. But if you know how to mix and match those various modules, you can now cross the boundaries of orthogonality. And what we're working on right now is developing six to eight different orthogonal Cas9s. So you can do CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A and DCAS9 and editing and epigenetics and imaging 
at the same time. Okay, so we've scoured the earth for various type two systems. We've looked at how they got RNAs, drive them, and we work on orthogonality of PAMs. So by the way, we also address diversity in PAM targeting. We characterize the Cas lines. We characterize the small interfering RNAs. And then eventually we show that they work, that they work well, that they drive interference in bacteria and in human cells and in plants, and that you can target different kinds of PAMs. This is genome editing 2.0, circa 2016, maybe even 2017. And where we want to go to is being able to navigate the genome, right? You don't have to ask the question, can you give me a guide that's good enough, that's specific enough, but I don't have to worry too much about off-targeting to knock out that gene? Because that's where we are right now. This is CRISPR-Thurka 2016. Give me a good guide that's going to work well, low frequency of target, high enough affinity and efficiency. And hopefully it's going to work. That's why you have to try three or four until you get the one you want. Eventually what we're going to do is say, I want to cut DNA right here. Give me the panel that goes with it. Give me the Cas9 that goes with it. Kind of like restriction enzyme. Like SPY Cas9 is the first restriction enzyme. Okay. Uh, and across doing that work, one thing we realize is that a PAM sequences are not a zero one proposition. So for SPY, for instance, you know, for those who do SPY here, take notes. For those who don't, just think about something else for a minute. Okay, for those of you who do SPY Cas9 based genome editing, the GN20NGG design is fundamentally flawed. It works for GN20NGG, but you're not accounting for the non canonical PAMs. So you can have NAG, right? So CGG, GGG, TGG, and AGG all work, but you can also target GAG and AAG. And if you don't account for that enough of our targeting, bad things are going to happen. The second learning is that from the orthogonality work we know, right, that depending on the RNA that you have, you can slide one base pair to the right. So Cas9 has the ability to have some flexibility structurally and slide one base pair to the right. And when you do that, it means you can have an NGG an NGG, an NGG, an NGG, an NGG, an NGG, and so on and so forth. So if you don't account for NAG, and you don't account for an NGG in your target design, resequence your genome, all of it, before bad things happen. I've said my piece. Okay. You can all wake up now. Now, one of the things that we do is we like ag. You guys like ag, so I feel compelled to talk about ag, right? So some of the new Cas9s that we have really enable us to drive even more efficient plant genome editing, notably maize, and then target different things. And what's cool about editing is not just the ability to do different edits. So this is exactly the sequence we're targeting here. When we target here, we make it a cut here, and then you get single deletion here, insertion of a T, of an A, of a C, or a G, large deletion, large deletion, large deletion, so on and so forth, right? And the frequency with which those different Natural repair events. Once you cut, if you don't add any DNA, and you can cut using CRRNAs in complex with RNPs or LNPs, so you don't have to use DNA to deliver CRISPR, you can use just RNA, RNPs, or LNPs. You can go non-GMO. So hang on to your questions for a minute. We can talk about that. But there are ways to harness CRISPR that's non-GMO if you don't use DNA to target your CRISPR. And if you let the endogenous DNA repair pathways do the job. And in this particular case, we now have surgical means to just insert a T, just insert a C, just insert an A, or just insert a G. You can almost screen, let's say, 100 plants and get the edit that you want. Natural event. We're there. So 2016, okay? And now we're on the cusp of being able to do all those things at the same time with orthogonal guide, the beauty of RNA diversity and structural idiosyncrasies. This is CRISPR-based genome editing. This is the CRISPR-fueled genome editing revolution. This is what's happening before our eyes. And this is why I call that, and I believe you should, CRISPR technologies with an S. 
Now, let's go into actual applications, right? 20 minutes we have left. Let's just talk about the real stuff that's happening in the real world. So, I work on bacteria. I'm a microbiologist by training. I love eukaryotes. I'm involved in a lot of companies that do ag, a lot of companies that do gene therapies. Now, let me tell you about bacteria for just five minutes, okay? So you can do a lot of things using CRISPR in bacteria, some of which harness native systems or exploit engineered systems. And because CRISPR is so ubiquitous and valuable in nature, right, there are many ways to harness native CRISPR-Cas systems in nature in non-GMO ways in bacteria. So the list, known exclusively here, is to do genotyping. Vaccination car is a genotype. Vaccinate cultures that make great yogurt or cheese. Vaccinate bacteria against the uptake and dissemination of plasmids that carry antibiotic genes. Think MRSA and VRSA and all that stuff. Genome editing 1.0, genome editing 2.0, genome remodeling showed an example, and then last but not least, using CRISPR as an antimicrobial. So in the shotgun series here, this is C. diff, right? C. diff in different hospitals. This is the vaccination card. We use the vaccination card to tell us where an isolate came from and how it relates to its cousins, right? So again, time goes right to left. This is the oldest events. They will share those first two events then this vaccination event, then this vaccination event, there's those vaccination events. You can rebuild phylogeny of infectious disease in humans and map them. So you can take C. diff, go into a bunch of C. diff genomes and serotypes and genotypes, make the collection of CRISPR-Cas systems and build trees based on conservation of the CRISPR fingerprint. You can do that and then map that onto maps of the world maps of hospitals, maps of people, travel patterns, and get metadata and big data on where infectious disease comes from and how it travels the world. People have been doing that at DuPont since 2004. I'll let you think about that. You can do the same, let's say, if you go to Chipotle. You guys have Chipotle over here? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> right, and you can do that. Salmonella and lettuce, salmonella and sandwiches, salmonella and people. We've done salmonella at the farm level in South Canada, like Wisconsin and Minnesota, right? You can go into a farm and then tell how big a salmonella problem do they have? Are they diverse? Is the salmonella in the animal the same as in the feed or the water or the dirt? Very powerful, so 2004. You can do the same with the coli. 01577, 026, 0103, 045, 0145, all those guys. And we've been doing this as well with others on all those bacterial pathogens. Some beneficial, some industrial, some medical. Think about that. One of my favorite applications of CRISPR is to use CRISPR to make great yogurt, you know, like a back to the beginning, back to the very beginning. So at DuPont, people are able and have been able to do that at the industrial scale for a while. And this is the way it works. You have your favorite strain. You can see this is my favorite strain. If I'm telling you, it has 32 spacers. And unfortunately, this strain is sensitive to four phages. You take that strain, expose it to a phage, select a variant that's resistant that acquired a new spacer. Take that guy, expose it to the second phage, take a variant that's resistant that acquired a new spacer. Take that guy, expose it to the third phage, take a variant that's resistant it has quite a new spacer. You do that for about two weeks in my lab. You have five to eight vaccination events. You're screening for natural events. And you have a super starter culture that will make super great yogurt forever. DuPont has been using this to make starter cultures on a global basis since 2011. So if you've had one slice of pizza, one cheeseburger, one bite of cheese, or one yogurt. Whether you're in Calgary, Saskatchewan, Toronto, Shanghai, Paris, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, or North Carolina, at one point since 2011, you have consumed a product enhanced by CRISPR. I'll let you think about that. And essentially, you can now do this for any industrial microbes of interest, and within two weeks, build up resistance against any phages of interest, breadth and depth of genotype, and you can just build those as you go. 
This is so 2015. You can do the same for phage. And you can now make superphage that are super resistant to phage resistance mechanisms. Ha, ha, ha. I'll let you think about that. And in many ways, you can use those very unique, very specific vaccination events to drive a unique genetic signature and fingerprint. And if I find my CRISPR signature in your product, I'm going to take you to court. And I can tell you're going to lose. And then last but not least, one of my favorite applications is we're able to use type 1 systems with a Pac-Man, like those guys, right? Those guys can come in, and then whether you start here, start here, start here, or start here in the genome, you can kill 99.999% of a cell. Okay? Even a high level density population of bacteria. And you can take two things, that I say like two young gentlemen with glasses and a red top, 99.9% .9 identical, and I can say I'm going to use a snip in that guy to just kill him. Use a snip in that guy to just kill him. Or if I don't like red, I'll just kill both. Okay? You can do the same with E. coli and salmonella that are only 71.8% identical and kill E. coli or salmonella or both. You now have sequence-specific antimicrobials that enable you to alleviate antimicrobial resistance and the eradication of the microbiome in broad-spectrum antibiotics. So the whole point here is that across the food supply chain, across the food supply chain, whether you're doing plants, animals, manufacturing, food, or human microbiomes, CRISPR is relevant for you. And the real key is to choose the right approach and the right tool for the right application, whether you want to do antivirals, antiplasmids, antitransposons, fingerprinting, editing, CRISPR-I, CRISPR-A, methylation of antimicrobials. So in closing, let me give you the two-minute spiel on the CRISPR craze. Because how cool as the science is, this stuff is crazy. I've seen it happen for 10 years. I can't believe my eyes. From a scientific standpoint, it's crazy enough to get people like me to win the Garner Award. It's crazy. It's crazy. Like, think about that, right? So CRISPR literature is evolving at a ridiculous rate. First CRISPR talk I gave, 27 papers total. Within one PhD cycle, it went from 27 papers total to one paper a month, to one paper a week, to one paper a day, to, as of last night, 1,900 papers thus far in 2016. Okay? More than 24,000 people have deposited plasmids, gotten plasmids, right? Shipped to 61 countries. Even like British Columbia has CRISPR. Think about that. Let's say at my lab scale, I've been to faculty at NC State for 189 weeks. In 189 weeks, we've published 58 papers. Every 3.2 weeks, we need to publish a paper for three years. I'll let you think about that. That's crazy. Okay? But however cool the science is, the media is crazier. Because the science, like, they give a good story, right? But like the media, like, they embellish stories. Right, so CRISPR is everywhere. I mean, the cover of Time, cover of The Economist, somebody put my car on Twitter, NPR, New York Times, Time, YouTube, The X Files, Jennifer Lopez. Like CRISPR is everywhere. I actually think about that. But however cool the science is and the media are, what's really the thing that's interesting to me is the business. Because I used to be in business. I went to business school. This is a slide that was from 2013. Within six months of the first proof of concept, those companies jumped in. They had no understanding, no knowledge, no IP. They still don't. No employees, no expertise, no technologies. And they went in. Pharma, ag, biotech, food. Large scale companies, Fortune 50 companies, small companies, low companies, VCs, and even not for profit companies. One of the biggest businesses of our lifetime. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been involved in the creation of a number of CRISPR companies. Right? Within two years, three companies went public. Intelia, Editas, and CRISPR-TX. Three IPOs in 2016. From zero to over a billion dollars worth of company value out of nowhere. I'll let you think about that. 
But in the end, however cool scientifically and cool from a media standpoint and cool from a business standpoint, right, we have, as scientists, to be mindful of the impact of disruptive technologies. Right? IP battle, the most epic battle of all time, unraveling before our eyes with the first interference hearing three days from now. Ethics, CRISPR babies, GMOs, non-GMOs, and regulatory paths, which is, by the way, why I think ag will win the CRISPR race. Now, what I think is going to happen next is going to be more democratized, more ag, more non-GMO regulation, more clinical success, more scale-up, and more need to work on DNA repair. I'm hopeful this was a good segue for you to understand the CRISPR science, the CRISPR technology, the CRISPR applications, and the CRISPR craze. And I'm going to thank my many collaborators, my many funding organizations and conflicts of interest. Chair, I was a former employee at DuPont and Pioneer. I'm a shareholder and board of directors for Caribou, shareholders, founder, and a senior member for Intelia, shareholder, founder, and a senior member for Locus, funding from government and states, collaborations with the government, collaborations with the state, and last but not least, I'm going to congratulate my fellow laureates and thank the Ginner Foundation for bringing me here and spread the gospel of CRISPR. Thank you. All right, so I'll take questions. So maybe we can have someone share the, the mic so the people who are taping can hear it. Ooh, fancy. Uh, yeah, so I had a question about uh, the ethics of all this. Um, so who exactly should get to use it? And should there be any type of uh, restriction on people who shouldn't be able to use it? Like, for example, you can imagine, like, the military Right, could do probably something pretty nefarious with it. Whereas you could have like food production and you could see a lot of good out of it. So I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on like the ethics of allowing this technology to be free in the wild. So it's not really ethics, it's more the, the, the safety, the safety and use of a, yeah. of a technology. Yes, yeah, so, so, so what happens when you are on the science highway, right? And CRISPR is like a bullet train on the science highway. And the level and pace of advancement of the technology supersedes the speed at which the guardrails are being built, right? So from a regulatory standpoint, from a control standpoint, from a Department of Defense standpoint, and, you know, dissemination standpoint, we don't have the measures or the tools in place as of yet to curtail or contain or control the applications, right? Now, it has to happen, and it is happening, there's a number of people, like the Department of Defense in the US, put CRISPR on the list of dangerous warfare technologies in 2016. I think it's still on there, as a matter of fact, right? There's a lot of people who are engaging and are having at this very moment, I mean, so 2015 in some ways, it started last year, but they are having those conversations with governmental agencies, non-for-profit agencies, NGOs, and the like, to direct and try to understand what kind of bylaws we should have at the domestic and international level to control the dissemination of CRISPR. This is in principle, because in reality, CRISPR is already in the garage. CRISPR can be synthesized for, with only a couple thousand dollars, $69 for a kit online. So anybody can, can do it for any reason or purpose as they want. And many people argue the opposite that when you have such a powerful technology, nobody can control who should or shouldn't use it, who should or shouldn't own it, how you should or should not use it. Because sometimes there's beneficial uses that we don't even know of yet. Sometimes there's things that are very beneficial that can turn out very negative. So there's no easy dichotomy or delineation of what's good versus bad. Oh, and by the way, when you talk about curing some genetic diseases, what you may think is justifiable to cure some people of certain disease genetically, somebody else may not agree. At the nation sovereignty level, what some nations say about whether you should or shouldn't do research for aiding of the germline, like the US has said no, 
to where they make the mistake of not doing it, but the UK and Sweden and Japan have given a green light on it. So is it a national province? Is it a provincial call? A national call? Is it an internet? Does the UN need to rule on who can use CRISPR? People are addressing those questions right now. Um, and what I like about this is that I think the right people are at the table. Uh, but I'm yet to hear a very strong consensus internationally on how we should define the use by, by laws. But we can't control it. We know that already. We can't control it. Please. Uh, from the standpoint of pure biology, it becomes absolutely obvious that it is not a GMO event, any sort of CRISPR-based um, immunization. However, from the commercial and legal standpoint, do we know how um, organizations and countries, European Union, for example, and China, and all other people who stand on the other side of the barricade when it comes to GMO, how do they see it? Do they see it as a legal loophole because it was not clearly uh, specified and defined in the law? Or did they agree already to the fact that it is not GMO? Or it just have never been a commercial releases of commodities or crops or bacteria or anything for them to deal with yet? Or yeah. did they admit that it is not GMO? So, so, so first of all, there are ways to do it that are GMO, clearly. So there are ways to do it when you bring in and port in foreign DNA, it can be GMO. So there's ways to use CRISPR that are GMO. There are ways to use CRISPR that currently don't fall into the GMO bucket. That's clear, it's been ruled on by the USDA. Waxy corn from Pioneer is an example. White button mushroom from Penn State is an example. Where those, pro those products, the products, and the methods that were used to manufacture them are perceived by regulatory agencies as non-GMO. Now, there are non-genome editing applications, like the vaccination, naturally, of dairy cultures that have been marketed for years, including in Europe, including in China on a global scale, where organizations have come out and say officially those are non-regulated organisms. Now, some of it is indeed intentional and educationally made decisions. In other cases, perception, notably by the public and by some PR people, is that there's a loophole, that you're genetically changing something using a non-regulated technology that makes a GMO GMO. And other people say, well, that's a non-GMO GMO, because we didn't use GMO technology to make the GMO. So, so, so there's, there's, those conversations are happening right now. The last thing you want to do is to repeat the GMO fiasco that we've been suffering for the last 25 or 30 years. Right? And, and people are very actively involved in the, the right conversation with the right people at the right place at the right time. Um, now, in many ways, however, it's important to be mindful, just like the ethics, just like the regulation, that people should prepare almost for a worst case scenario. Because the public, regardless of what the regulators say, the public will have an opinion. And oftentimes, fear is one of the strongest emotions in humankind, right? And people are scared of what they don't know or don't understand. And once you scare them with the technology that they don't understand, it's very hard to have a scientific conversation as to why they should not be scared. So there's a lot of people right now very actively working on educating, educating the public, but also educating the agencies that need to make those decisions. So it's, it's if people are committed to doing this, it is happening, but we're not quite done as of yet, and it might take time. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is on the research in regards to administration of CRISPR-Cas to humans. Um, for example, when we know when we talk about anti-cancer drugs, some of them are more easily administered, for example, than others, and you know, there's solubility issues, et cetera, and this, given that this is a protein, for example, right? Like, as their so, you know, research. So, so there's, there's two two key things to consider with delivery. Number one is what are you delivering? So you don't always deliver proteins, actually. Sometimes you deliver DNA, actual constructs that encode both the Cas9 and the guide, right? Or you can deliver mRNA and small interferon CRISPR RNAs directly and directly transfect mRNA only, right? And you can even transform or transfect RNPs or LNPs. Now, it depends upon what kind of cell you're working with, what kind of efficiency do you want, 
what kind of disease you're trying to address, and so on and so forth. And that's why if you really look and dig into the current translational applications, right, ex vivo therapy is the number one on the list. Because you can take human cells out of human body, ex vivo, target them, edit them, check them, resequence the whole thing to make sure that you're safe and then re-inject those cells into a patient. That's why the blood delivery type model, immunotherapies that way, are a quote-unquote lower hanging fruit. Number two, muscle and eye disease, because it's easy to inject, obviously. Right? The eye, not that it's pleasant to inject the eye or the muscle, but it's an option. And number three is the liver, because by nature, biologically, the detoxification role of the liver enables it to kind of, you know, take in, take up, absorb, and manage foreign chemicals and molecules that come in. So liver diseases are at the very top of the list. Um, and obviously, people are primarily focusing on understood, characterized, single gene type genetic diseases. That's why DMD makes sense, Fanconi anemia, hemo hemoglobinopathies and the like are, are on the list of known targets and usual suspects. Um, nonetheless, some ambitious people, even like, like Fong, you know, are already starting to recapitulate thousands of SNPs potentially involving schizophrenia, you know, or things like metabolic diseases like you know, obesity and others. Um, so so you, know, you don't have to limit yourself to what's feasible today. And when you look at the pace at which the technology is advancing and some of those publication rates and citation rates and dissemination rates, we are going to be there so much faster than people think. Three years ago, people were like, it's going to take 10 years to take us through the clinic. Last year, people said it was going to take three years to go to the clinic. This year, we're in. So the pace, the scale, and the success with which we're seeing progress is just unbelievable. Great, but also scary, which is why we have the issues with the pace at which the guardrails are being built. Uh, where do you see CRISPR CPF1 moving along with uh, CRISPR Cas9? Uh, for genome editing purposes, given its structural differences? So, it's no one year as good. No one year as good. No one year as diverse, actually. Um, so, on a direct comparison to SPYCAS9, it really doesn't perform well. Some of it is published, some of it is not published because people can't publish what doesn't work. Um, now, what I like about CPF1, though, is not about a, a head to head comparison with SPYCAS9 or other Cas9s because they're not as diverse or efficient or specific. Um, what I like about CPF1 is the type of cleavage that you get, right? So with the sticky and cut, the type of edits that you get, the type of repair machineries that you trigger and that you recruit are very different. So I think in some cases, and that's why Nikkei's, Nikkei's type applications and Cas9s are going to be promising moving forward because I believe that the more we understand about DNA repair pathways and outcomes and landscape of repair outcomes, I think things that do sticky end versus just blunt will have potential, depending on what you want to achieve in, with your edit. So I see some potential, but nowhere near as powerful, no potent, no promising as Cas9. Uh, on target. You were as far away as possible. Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, so in bacteria with type 2 uh, CRISPR systems, do they all have RNAs3? Is that always what's doing the RNA processing? Yes, yes, when it works, yes. And okay. RNAs3 is pretty, pretty widespread as well. Um, so one thing I didn't get to mention, which is interesting when you ask those kind of questions, is, is how compatible are those systems with one another, right? Um, so RNAs3 is a very widespread, very commonly used, very highly expressed and transcribed sometimes protein in bacteria. Um, and so the answer to your question is yes, but most interestingly, most importantly, some bacteria have multiple co-occurring CRISPR-Cas CRISPR systems that all function and depend upon some of the same RNAs. So not only are they there, but the way in which they're processed is very copacetic very harmonious, there's no competition, um, and there's no sign whatsoever from an energetic standpoint, genetic standpoint, and transcriptional standpoint, that the CRISPR arrays are coming at the cost for CRISPR independent core processes in the biochemistry of the cell.
I just wish more people would ask questions about bacteria, but that's okay. So I'll ask a really uh, basic science question regarding bacteria, but uh, during that initial inoculation event, where some uh, bacteria unfortunately becomes exposed to some phage and then some protospacer gets incorporated into the CRISPR array. Um, how does the machinery know to discern self from non-self? Is anything known about that? So, so, so a number of people are working on this right now. The dominant hypothesis is a methylation pattern. Um, but we do see, this, and people don't be published, but most people have, have missed it. We do see at low frequency self-targeting events. And by definition, those are selected against, right? So one thing I didn't say, which is important to understand, is that the, the, the rate of vaccination, right, and the frequency at which acquisition events occur is very low. So it's less than one in a million, even in the ideal conditions. So the vaccination rate is low, and then within that vaccination rate, the self-targeting is about one in a thousand to one in a million. So now you're at 10 to minus 12 depending on the, the, the condition that you have. So, so it does occur, it is a very rare event. But when this event occurs, it's so lethal that unless you do deep sequencing without screening populations, you don't even notice it. So it is happening in nature, it is the cost of doing business from an acquisition standpoint. Um, but li likely it, it, it's a methylation pattern. Not being proven yet, but, but most likely outcome. Um, what's interesting though is that once you're vaccinated, the reason why you don't target your own CRISPR array is because the PAM is only in the protospacer and you have the CRISPR repeat next to your targeting spacer. So that's how the self, non-self dichotomy is distinguished. And Luciana Marafini and Eric Santamer have shown that very elegantly back in 2010. So the self, non-self is in play more so at the interference level than the acquisition level. I just wanted to know if the CRISPR system is only, I guess, can only be used against viruses with DNA genomes, or if there are viruses, like if the viruses with RNA genomes that aren't translated back to cDNA or something, are they immune to CRISPR? So, so no, the answer is no. So, so different CRISPR-Cas systems target different kind of nucleic acids. In type three systems, mRNA is the target. And we have evidence, circumstantial evidence using bioinformatics, that some of those target single-strand RNA phages in archaea mostly. It's not a lot known about viruses in Archaea, but we can go there. Um, now, in addition to viruses, CRISPR can also target plasmids, transposons, and even foreign DNA. So it's not just a viral defense mechanism. It's an invasive DNA defense mechanism. Um, and you can see, or you can try to infer from the matches from the protospacer to global databases what the targets may be. And we do see in silico targeting of mRNAs. For type threes, type sevens, and new types, people are working on RNA, yeah. Um, but to go back to your virus replication cycle question, I think we're yet to see DNA targeting CRISPRs target RNA viruses at the DNA stage. I don't think it's been proven as of yet. The last part of your question is interesting because it begs the question as to how do viruses escape CRISPR? So there's six distinct CRISPR escape mechanisms that we and others have characterized to date. I can give a whole talk about this because it's what excites me. Uh, and we've done long-term studies of coevolution of virus and phage populations versus their host to see how you can push the envelope. Um, and one thing that's interesting is in some cases, the phage genome selectively, specifically, and precisely escapes CRISPR by hypermutating the sequences in the genome that get hammered all the time by CRISPR. And there's a bias there. And what's interesting, it's not random, but I can talk about that. And what's interesting is that when you have multiple coexisting viral genotypes in a population, they mix and match the modules in their genomes that are more targeted by CRISPR at higher rates. So within CRISPR immunity, maybe one of the drivers of viral genome mosaicism in nature in some species. Um, and last but not least, in a very cool, relatively recent kind of discovery, People have found that in Pseudomonas, there are phages that acquire anti-CRISPR proteins that prevent targeting, mostly in type 1E and type 1F systems, and then there's pending news about the type 2s. 
Um, so they are anti crystal proteins that prevent the nucleases from being efficient. None of those yet found in uh, mRNA targeting CRISPRs. Um, I have a question, and it's more philosophical than anything else. Um, it shows my age. There was apparently um, a meeting of the physicists, and they were discussing the expansion of the universe, the origins of the universe. And Einstein apparently said, God does not play dice, right? To which somebody responded, don't tell God what to do, okay? The second part of that is that I worked with somebody who did very well in medicine, won a Nobel Prize, who agreed that we shouldn't tell God what to do, that God metaphorically knows where he's going. Does CRISPR get to the stage where we are telling God what to do? In some ways, yes. So in some applications, yes. And actually in some of those very experiments I just mentioned to you, what we're trying to do in the lab, not in nature, it's in the lab, lab containment, right? We are trying to drive viral genome evolution to extinction by maximizing or titrating the targeting of areas of the genomes that we know cannot mutate. And when you mutate them too much, the viruses can't make it. And we've successfully done that actually in the lab. We're not going to do that in nature because nature always finds a way, right? And in many ways, this is what scares people with gene drives. When we try to go into a mosquito population, right, and drive reproduction to zero, or 99.9% .9 sterilization, so you don't disseminate an infectious disease agent for humankind. But the gene drives people always say, other species of mosquitoes arise, the ecosystem has the ability to mount a response uh, that will escape or overcompensate the action that you're trying to take. So, and I think it's making some people uncomfortable um, because you can't predict what you don't know. So when you try to account for a countermeasure to an experiment where you try to do something to zero, oftentimes things that you don't know or predict are going to happen, and you don't want to do that when it's too late. And that's why the Department of Defense um, has some concerns about potential uses of CRISPR, because you could, you could weaponize or render more virulent something so much faster than you can manage it that you may have a, a conundrum. Any further questions? Dr. I'll thank you all for your attention and you. keep calm and crystal on. <laughs>